Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Embrace. So grateful you have chosen to worship the Lord with us here this morning. I want to go ahead and invite you to stand and sing with us. We're going to get started this morning with a song that um, some of us may know. It might be a little bit new, but one of the reasons that we worship together is not just because music is pretty, but because it gives us the opportunity to declare again the gospel, what God has done on our behalf. And so this song does a great job of declaring that. And so we're going to sing it together this morning. declared together what love can do, we get to sing a song about putting on love. Because not only does God do that for us in our lives, but we get to wear his love. He literally empowers it all. And then to be love to one another.
something a little bit new that's actually kind of old. So um, every week the lectionary gives us a gospel text, which is what we've been preaching on because this is our year with Jesus and Jesus's life is in the gospels. But we're also given other texts every week by the lectionary, including a psalm. And so this week the psalm is just really powerful, really beautiful words. And we wanted to worship with the psalm. And we're not just going to read it, we're going to sing it together. And so this is a tradition that has existed throughout the ages of Christian worship. Um, there used to be tavern tunes that everybody knew really well. And so the tavern tunes would get played in church and they would sing the psalms in the place of them. That's how we got a lot of our hymns, familiar tunes with new words. And so we're actually going to use the tune, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, to sing the words of Psalm 146. So that might feel kind of like brain bending at first. But it actually, your, your musical sense will just take over, even if you don't feel like you have one. It'll be there. Um, and so just kind of think the words to come thou fount for the very first line, and it'll give you the tune, and then you can just kind of keep going, okay? And so this actually comes from a resource I want you all to know about, because not only are the Psalms great for worship when we're together, but they're great for worship on your own, in your own life. And so there is a resource called the Seedbed Psalter, so Psalter is spelled P-S like Psalm. And you can just Google that, or you can email me and I will send you a link. But it is an entire metrical Psalter. So every single one of the Psalms has been put in meter so that it fits with tunes, so that you can sing it. And the wife of Asbury Seminary's president did that. Julie Tennant is her name. And so it's available free on their website. It tells you the tunes that you can sing with the song. It plays the tune for you if you're not sure if you know it. And it gives you all the words. So it's a great resource. Check it out if you're interested. The psalms were originally worship songs. And we've, you know, we don't know their tunes. But we have tunes that we know that we can sing and continue to use the psalms to worship. So, sorry I'm a little long-winded. That's the explanation. The words will be on the screen, and just think the first line of Come Thou Found to get yourself the tune. Praise the Lord, my soul, oh, praise him. To the Lord your praises give. I will praise him my whole life, sing praise to God long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in mere men who cannot say. When they die, their plans are nothing. They descend into the grave. Blessed is the one whose help is Jacob's God. How blessed is he. Blessed Yeah. 
Lord watches o'er the strangers and sustains the fatherless, helps the widows, but he frustrates wicked ones who would oppress. The Lord God will reign forever, your God Zion evermore. He reigns for all generations. Hallelujah, praise the We have declared truth to one another this morning. Be encouraged, people of God. Now we're going to turn and share our gratitude and lament with one another. This is a way to bring your whole self to worship. You don't have to show up here and be fake. You can celebrate what you're celebrating and lament the things that are difficult. And we make space to do that with one another so that none of us are here alone. So if you will, just turn to a nearby neighbor, spend a few moments, share something you're grateful for and something you lament. And you can thank each other for the sharing. We'll come back in a couple minutes.
Maybe take like 30 more seconds and wrap up your conversations. All right, you can continue to talk to one another after the service. In fact, we hope that you will do that. But if you can, go ahead and turn back towards the front. I've got just a few things to share with us all as we're together here this morning. I'm tempted to make you clap your hands if you can hear me. That's a youth group thing. Yeah? All right. <laughs> okay. So this morning, I want to just thank you for sharing your gratitude and laments and for worshiping with one another and for showing up to be family. That's what we are in this place. We have a lot going on here and would love for you to know about it and to be involved. And so if you do not currently receive our announcement email, we would love to add you to that list. You can let us know by filling out a Connect card. So those are in the pews in front of you. They are bright blue. And you can give us your information that way, as well as tell us if you want to meet with a pastor or learn more about volunteering. There's all sorts of really great options on there. So check that out. It's an easy way to communicate with us. And I will personally get back in touch with you after that. I look forward to having conversation. Um, and then if you have a prayer request this morning, you can also put that on the Connect card. There's a space on the back. It's a white box. And you can turn that in at either the box at the back door or this side door this morning. That's also our offering box. So if you would like to give while you are in the building this morning, you can do that. You can also always give at EmbraceYourCity.com slash give. And you can also send prayer requests to prayer at EmbraceYourCity.com. So lots of options. I think there's even UR, UR codes. Is that what it's called? Why does my brain doubt that all of a sudden? Uh, yes, the scannable code on the Connect card. Um, so those are great options for getting in touch with us. We hope that if you came in here with something heavy on your heart, you will let us partner with you in prayer. We believe in the power of prayer. Um, I will also encourage you to read the announcement handout. It goes out in an email, and then if you come in, there is a handout on the welcome tables, and there is good information on there. This morning, I want to just highlight one very exciting announcement. A couple weeks ago, those of you who were here might have noticed that like half the sanctuary left when we dismissed the kids, because there's so many kids, which is a fantastic, wonderful sign of growth. And we are so excited about that. But it has become the case that we now need a new classroom rather quickly because we are bursting out of the seams upstairs in a great way. And so my exciting news for you is that we are about to open a third Wonder Room classroom. So we, yeah, let's clap for that. That's really good news. We originally started with all of the age groups together in one classroom, and then after a couple years added a second and split them, and now we get to have three different classrooms, and we're very excited for that. So there are two ways that you can participate in this growth and this exciting moment in our church community. First of all, you can be a volunteer in the new Wonder Room. And so we have a fantastic team of volunteers. Um, pretty much all of our storytellers have been with us for more than a year, some as many as four and five years. This is not something that people do once and then walk away most of the time. This is an incredible opportunity, really fun. People who do it really enjoy it. If you want to know more about being a storyteller, ask Jackie or Julie or Jeremy. They would love to gush about it, I'm sure. There's lots of other folks who can tell you too. But I am going to need like, Six adults, okay? I'm putting that number out there. You could be one of six and answer that call. And three of those people will be storytellers, which is the main adult role. So if you like story, if you like to lead a lesson, it's not a real lesson. You're not like a teacher. It's really cool, I promise. It's like Montessori. Um, so three of those people will be like the main teacher, and three of those people will be the doorkeeper, which is the support adult. So I'm putting it out there, and if you have any interest, or if you know your heart's like beating a little faster, however you want to identify your interest, um, talk to me about it. I would love to help you get connected with the Wonder Room. So that's way number one. You can also support the opening of the new classroom financially. So this is going to be outside of our regular annual budget because we're doing it pretty quick. Um, and so it'll take us two to $3,000 to open this new classroom. And if you would like to give towards that, you can do that this morning in the offering box or online. Just note new Wonder Room as your memo. So that is our exciting announcements for this morning. And before we release to the Wonder Room, we have a really wonderful opportunity this morning. We're going to hear a special musical number from Ailey, accompanied by her dad and Cammy. So Ailey, will you come up front for us? Yeah. 
Idly is one of our Wonder Room students. And she is also a very bold, very brave, beautiful singer. And so she's going to continue to lead us in worship this morning by singing Cast My Cares. And let's give her one more round of applause. Thank you so much, Eileen. And now we will dismiss the children and their leaders to the Wonder Room.
Happy birthday, Paige. <laughs> Leave it up to Dan to embarrass someone in front of the whole church. I'm going to pray. It's hard to follow up that. I mean, that was amazing. She's got a gift, and I'm so glad she was able to share that with you all this morning. Got to get Eile up here singing more often. Um, I'm going to pray for us. Let's bow our heads. Lord, the words to beautiful song that Eile shared with us are speaking to me this morning. God, we, many of us are going through hard times, just some of us feel like we're walking through a long, just kind of dark road, or we're kind of stuck in the middle of a really difficult season. And God, I thank you for that reminder that, that you're with us, that you're greater still, that you are the God who is always greater than any terribleness this world will throw at us. And so, God, I pray that this morning we could hear that reminder and that we would leave here encouraged and more empowered and more inspired. That, Lord, we, we could feel more connected to you and your goodness. God, we need you so, so much. God, I'm just praying this morning that you would meet us here in this place. I pray this morning, Lord, that we could tap into to your heart and, and what it is, God, you're wanting to speak from your heart to our heart this morning. I pray we would come away knowing and, 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 and thinking about how we can embrace your heart and your love for those who struggle. As the psalm we, we sang talks about, as the songs we were singing were talking about. That, Lord, we would be able to put on love just a little bit more this morning as we leave. God, I pray that the words that, we, that I share, the scriptures that we read, would speak to us this morning, that our hearts would be open to you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So y'all got to bear with me. I lost my voice earlier in the week, and it's still not 100% back. Uh, as a preacher, it's hard to rest your voice because you have to talk, you know. Um, had a wedding I did uh, on... Friday night, so good and rest then either. So I'm here, and I'm not going to have a lot of volume, so a good thing I have a microphone. So our text for today um, is similar to last week, actually. And so if you were here last week, it was a, a challenging text about wealth, about economics, about how we operate here in this world, and how we use this worldly wealth to, to work for the common good. And our text for today is similar. Our text for today, you could describe as a warning tale. It's a warning. It's a story that will probably make us all uncomfortable. It's a story that should serve as a wake-up call to us. And honestly, it's a bit of a terrifying story. And it's haunted Christians for nearly 2,000 years. It's a story, it's been described that it comforts the afflicted, but afflicts the comfortable, all right? And so if you are afflicted this morning and struggling, perhaps it will be encouraging to you. Uh, if you are comfortable this morning, then I think it'll probably make you a bit uncomfortable. But that is kind of who we are at Embrace. We try to lean in and, and let the text speak to us in the way that it needs to. And so it's a story uh, that Jesus told in the Gospel of Luke. It's a, it's a parable. It's a warning tale. So we're going to get into it. But before I read it to you, I want to remind you of Jesus' words from last week. He said, you cannot serve both God and money. All right? And so uh, just, this is going to frame kind of what we're talking about. So if y'all want to turn with me to Luke chapter 16. Uh, if you have a Bible, you can, but no pressure because the words will be right behind me on the screen Luke chapter 16, and we're going to read verses 19 through 31. I'm going to read it slowly again so that you can follow along with the story. And this is Jesus telling a story. <clears throat> he says, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. 
At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. And so he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am an agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm, a great divide has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross from there to us. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also Come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said. But if someone from the dead goes to them, then they will repent. He said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. So as you probably noticed, this story begins the same way as the parable from last week. There was a rich man. Same exact beginning to both of these parables. They go together as one. So, we're talking about economics again. And uh, I'll tell you, of all the social issues of Jesus' day, he talked about economics more than any of the others. And perhaps because economics has such a profound impact on our lives. Jesus seemed to understand kind of the the dangerous power of wealth. Now this rich man in the story is portrayed as an extremely wealthy, indulgent, kind of self-consumed person. It's kind of an over-the-top description. He wore purple and fine linen. These were clothes only reserved for the most wealthy people. He lived in luxury every day, it's said, basically meaning he was feasting and indulging and stuffing his face every single day of the week. You know, Jews loved to celebrate and to party, but parties were meant to be shared on special occasions in community with other people. But this man is described as as daily, without community, feasting and partying by himself. Now, this extremely rich man is contrasted with another individual who, with a, a bit of an over-the-top description, a poor man named Lazarus. Now, it's interesting, a piece of the text, that we're not told the rich man's name, but we are told Lazarus' name. And this is the only man up to this point, and really, Lazarus and Abraham are the only two people who receive names in Jesus' parables uh, throughout the Gospels. So Lazarus is portrayed as the exact opposite of the rich man. Now, if the rich man were like the top 1%, then Lazarus was the bottom 1%. He was separated from the rich man in every single way. In the Roman world in the first century, there was a big, big gap between the wealthy and the poor. And a not-so-fun fact, today the gap in our world is even larger than it was back then between the rich and the poor. So Lazarus was brought to the gate of this rich man's estate. Now, perhaps some of his friends or somebody took him there and laid him there because they were hoping that the rich man would give him food or drink or something. Often outside the gate of a wealthy person's estate, there might be a bench there where the poor would come sit 
And, and they would wait for the leftovers or wait for alms that would be given from the wealthy because in that culture, it was expected that the wealthy would give at least something to support those who were poor. They didn't have social services like we do today. This is how they function in society. And so it would have been expected for this wealthy man to give something to Lazarus. Now, this rich man instead ignored Lazarus. Lazarus was covered in sores, starving for just little scraps of food, yet he received nothing. The dogs uh, were caring for the man more than the rich man, licking his sores, perhaps providing some measure of relief. You know, this gross contrast between these two men reminds me of uh, my time in West Palm Beach, Florida. My wife got a temp job there when we were in college, serving food at the Breakers, which was this kind of opulent, wealthy hotel on Palm Beach Island. And at the end of the night, all the staff were instructed that all the food, they were to throw in the trash, all the leftover food into the dumpster. And my wife is a very compassionate woman, and, and in college she was the same way. She had met a lot of folks who lived on the streets in West Palm Beach, and she's like, hey, can I take some of this food and share it with people? And they said, no, we have to throw it all in the trash. Beautiful cakes and foods and sides and vegetables, all these things, right into the trash. All the while, all across the way, the intercoastal waterway, just right across the river, was one of the highest concentration of people who didn't have homes in the entire country. So the wealthy at the breakers feasted daily and couldn't even share leftovers with the poor across the river. So back to the story. Suddenly the text tells us that the men died in the story. And the text tells us that the rich man was buried and we're not sure if Lazarus actually received a burial. Perhaps he didn't, being as poor as he was. All too often, those who are dishonored in life are also dishonored in death. So Lazarus was taken away by angels to Abraham's side. Now, this is an interesting way that they translated it, because the text actually says in, in Greek that it was Abraham's bosom that he was taken to. So I guess the interpreters were like, eh, it seems a little weird. He's going to be like reclining on Abraham's breast. But that's what the to- story is telling us. And so the image here is like of Abraham, of, of Lazarus going and reclining on Abraham's breast at a wonderful feast. Now think about for a Jew, I mean, this would be one of the highest honors, right? Feasting with Abraham, the father of their faith in the afterlife. So the rich man, on the other hand, went to another place. We don't know how far away they were from one another. But he could see Abraham and Lazarus from where he went. But he went to a place called Hades. And it says he was in torment. And he looked up and he was able to see Lazarus and Abraham feasting together. Now think about it. I'm sure part of his torment was looking up and seeing this poor man named Lazarus in this place of privilege and power. It probably stressed him out. To look up there and see Lazarus there in the place that he probably felt like he was supposed to be. Because in this life, he had received all the privilege and all the praise and honor, but no longer had he. You know, we've been seeing a lot of uh, particularly white people recently. Um, I would say these are racist uh, kind of thoughts that they're having, but they're being tormented over seeing people of color represented in their favorite movies and TV shows. And in a way, it's similar, but this is much more intense, obviously. But looking and seeing people in positions of power and privilege that they don't think ought to be there, right? And this is something that I'm sure was going on in this rich man's mind. And so in his torment, he called to Abraham, trying to get Abraham to help him. He probably assumed Abraham would be on his side because, you know, he had always got his own way in his earthly life. So listen to what he asked Abraham. He said, send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and come cool my tongue. Now, two things about this. First, he knew Lazarus' name. He knew who the poor man by the gate was. He had seen him. 
He knew who he was. He even knew his name. He knew that he was suffering. He couldn't claim that I didn't see this guy. I didn't know who he was. No, he knew him, and he still did nothing. Second, even after he died and was in torment, he thought that he was still better than Lazarus. He thought he could give Lazarus an order to get the water and bring it down to him to cool his tongue. He thought Lazarus still ought to serve him. How crazy is that? Abraham spoke back to the rich man, telling them, he's like, basically, you've had all you wanted in your lifetime, and Lazarus had nothing. Now Abraham said, it's all turned upside down. Now Lazarus is comforted, and you are not. And then he tells him, there's actually a great chasm, a great divide between you and us, and you can't cross it. This ought to remind us of the Luke themes of a radical reversal that I've talked about many times, that the poor are going to be lifted up and the rich will be brought low. Then Lazarus cried out again for a second time, asking Abraham to send Lazarus on an errand for him. He said, Abraham, send Lazarus to go warn my siblings so that they won't be in this place of torment also in the future. Now, Abraham told the rich man that he did not, they didn't need a warning after all. He told them that the siblings, they had Moses, they had the prophets. They were pretty clear in those books uh, throughout the Old Testament of how they ought to treat others, particularly those who are suffering. So he's like, they've already heard it. They should know better. The rich, people, the rich man still didn't think it was enough, and so he argued, well, here's the deal, Abraham. If someone rises from the dead and goes and speaks to them, of course they're going to change their life, and of course they're going to listen. And then Abraham closed the story by saying these words. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they're not going to be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Now, do you see kind of why this is a disturbing story? <laughs> it really, for me, it holds up that uncomfortable mirror <laughs> in front of me, forcing me to consider some things that I would probably like to just ignore. Now, I want you to just think what comes to your mind as you read this story. I'll give you some ideas. Perhaps... It forces you to consider how your actions in this life might affect what happens in the afterlife. That's a scary thought, right? Perhaps our actions matter now. Or maybe you're thinking about how you treat those who are suffering at your own gate, in your own family, in your own neighborhood. In America, we ought to think about at our southern border how we are treating those suffering on the other side of the gate. Perhaps you're thinking about the great chasm that cannot be crossed. That's a very terrifying image, right? And maybe it's causing you some anxiety thinking about what happens after we die. Maybe you're wondering if you truly serve God or if you're all serving the mammon system, the money system that we talked about last week. I mean, maybe you feel good about the rich man's torment. And you're like, I don't care if he, he's tormented, he deserved it. And maybe you feel guilty about that. Or maybe you feel sorry for him, and you're like, Abraham, can you give him another shot, you know? Maybe that's what you're thinking. So many things that are probably going through our minds as we hear a story like this. And I'm going to remind you what I said last week. That's exactly what parables are supposed to do. <laughs> They're supposed to provoke us into looking at our lives asking hard questions, and considering how we might live differently. Now, I'm going to tell you my own take on this. I don't believe personally, as I've read this story, I don't think it's really meant to teach us all these specifics about heaven and hell and what it looks like. I don't think that's Jesus' purpose here. But I do see this as a wake-up call. It's a story he told to get us thinking Maybe to scare us a little bit, to shock us a little bit, to provoke us to try to live differently now, specifically in regards to how we treat those who are suffering around us. I read a commentary on this passage that compared this parable to a, a Christmas carol by Charles Dickens. Have y'all heard this story? Um, well, in the story, there's a rich man named Ebenezer Scrooge, and he is very selfish. He is very greedy in his life. 
Now on Christmas Eve, he's visited by multiple ghosts in a dream. And, and basically in the dream, they pull back the curtain for him so he can see kind of how his actions in this earthly life are affecting others and how they might affect people in the future. And these dreams are quite terrifying for him. And, and it was a very scary experience. But ultimately what happened is they served as a wake-up call for this man to change his life. And he wakes up a different man on Christmas Day. Now Jesus' terrifying story of the rich man and Lazarus, I believe, serves a similar purpose. I believe it is meant to prod us from our slumber and to wake us up to see the massive chasm that exists today in this life between the rich and the world, or rich and the poor in our world today. And I think it's a call to join Jesus and his work to bridge that gap and to show solidarity with those who are in need. You know, if this story is meant to be a wake up call, then the audience, those who are listening to it, I think in a way we ought to identify with the people who are still living in the story. Now, he talks about three brothers. Brothers can also, even though it's masculine in the Greek, it could refer to sisters as well. So we'll just call them siblings. He has five siblings that he's worried about. Now, the five siblings, they're all still alive in the story. And they still have the opportunity to open their ears, to rehear the words in Scripture, telling them time and time again God's heart for those who suffer. They still have a chance to dig back in, open their ears, and be willing to hear what the Bible is actually telling us about all this. They also still have the opportunity to open their eyes and to see those who are suffering around them. The rich man did not see Lazarus. He did not care. And they still have the opportunity to open their lives and really rethink how they might draw their circle much wider and include all people in their loving embrace. I want to read uh, these words from a woman named Barbara Rossing. And I want these to be a final kind of reflection for you all this morning. But she says, we are those five siblings of the rich man. We who are still alive have been warned about our urgent situation. The parable makes clear. We have Moses and the prophets. We have the Scriptures. We have the manna lessons of God's economy, about God's care for the poor and hungry. We even have someone who has risen from the dead. And the question is, will we, the five sisters and brothers, see? In the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, amen. You know, I kind of this morning just wanted to lay out the text for you and lay out the story for you. And I want you all to do some reflection yourself on kind of where God may be leading you in this. Our story last week and our story this week make it abundantly clear that, that Jesus really cares about the way we use our resources, that Jesus cares about who we choose to see. Jesus cares about who we include and who we bring into our communities and we need to be mindful of that. And, and, you know, it's hard to read stories like this because they do scare us a little bit. They do cause us to, to ask a lot of questions. And I just want to remind you, Jesus is inviting you to join him. He's inviting you to walk with him. And he'll, he'll show you the specifics. He'll help you learn how to actually live out um, this radical calling to love all people. Uh, and he'll invite you on that journey. He'll show you there's grace for that journey. We don't have to have it all figured out just yet. I don't want y'all to come away from this text being scared of hell or something like that because I'm not sure that's what Jesus is trying to do. I think he's trying to wake us up and say, hey, this is urgent. This matters. We need to think about how we're living our lives. We need to think about who we're separated from. John Wesley, uh, my friend, shared a, a quote from him recently, and he said something along the lines, the church doesn't do much for the poor because we never go visit. We never spend time with them. And, and that's the reality. We've set up a world where we're separate from one another. There's a great chasm that exists between those who have and those who don't. And as God's people, people who follow Jesus, we have to be committed 
to bridging that gap and making that um, where there's not such a great divide, where everybody has enough and can survive and, and thrive in life. So we're going to share communion this morning. Um, if you don't have a communion cup, there's some at the table by the door where you come in there. You can go grab one. You know, Jesus is uh, loving and he says a lot of encouraging and really beautiful things, but Jesus is also a little rough around the edges and a little difficult sometimes. And uh, I think we need to embrace the full nature of who Jesus was and is for us. And so that's why I love that we are going through the text and we're looking at all the stories and we're looking at all the passages, even the tough ones like this one today. And if we're willing to lean in, if we're willing to get close to Jesus who is a little bit uncomfortable, you know, when you get close to the truth, it can hurt. <laughs> um, if we're willing to lean in and endure some of that discomfort, then I think we can be changed. We can be transformed. And transformation is never easy. It's always a bit difficult. I know in my life that's true. Any of y'all working through something like that, you know it's hard to work through hard things and to change and to be transformed and, and even experience healing. And so I encourage y'all to lean into Jesus as we share communion, as we close with a song, and just know that Jesus loves you and he's, he's on your team and he's inviting you into this radical life of following him because it's the best way we can ever live. If y'all bow your heads with me just for a moment. I've got to pray that you would meet us here in this moment. We confess to you, Lord, that we <laughs> confess to you, Lord, that we, we often just ignore the things we don't want to hear. That we tune out the things that we don't like. We close our eyes to the things we don't want to see. And I pray this morning, Lord, that we could open our hearts and open our minds, open our eyes, open our lives to the full picture of who you are. We could listen to, go all the way back to Moses and listen to, the, to your heart that, that's clearly displayed in the Exodus, how you set people free from slavery and from oppression. and What you did in the wilderness, how you provided for everyone and didn't allow anyone to have more than they needed. You let everybody have enough and, and have an abundance. Help us to see that. Help us to see what the prophet said time and time again about how we ought to love and, and encourage and help one another. And help us, Lord, to see your example and to receive it, what you laid out for us when you walked among us and taught, showed us by example, went to the cross, endured suffering and pain to show us how we ought to live. So this morning, Lord, I'm just praying we can lean into you real close and be courageous enough to do it and receive you, receive your message this morning. Speak to our hearts in the way we need to hear because each of us needs something probably a little bit different this morning. I pray your Holy Spirit would speak to us. I pray you pour out your Holy Spirit upon this bread and juice that it would be for us the body and blood of Christ, that you would fill us up today in a fresh way we'd leave here changed because we've encountered you, the living God. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you want to get out the little wafer on top, those of you who are at home worshiping with us online, you can get out whatever food or drink you've set aside for this purpose. And I encourage you to take and eat. This is the body of Christ broken for you. I encourage you to take and drink. This is the blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. We're going to continue to worship together as we end our time. Um, I'll invite you all to stand as we sing our closing song. This is a song really about, um, about God's Word. It's a song about those ancient words that we find in our Bible that teach us and guide us in the way of life and truth and justice. So we're going to sing a song celebrating that and hopefully inspiring us to go back to God's Word and allow it to speak to us um, in all the ways that we need to hear. If you need prayer this morning, um, I'd be happy and be honored to pray with you. I'll just be over here. Just come find me um, and I'll uh, lift you up.
Amen. Well, thank you all so much for being here this morning. Um, I hope that God spoke to you in some way or stirring in your heart in some way. I encourage you to to work with that, to hold on to that, talk to somebody um, about what God may be doing or stirring up in you right now, um, and really try to hold on to whatever word God is speaking you today. Um, if y'all receive your hearts or prepare your hearts for the benediction, may the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen. Go in God's peace. We'll see you next time.